So we're going to get started now. And once again, I'd like to welcome you all to Yad Vashem, so to speak. We're thrilled to have you here with us for our sixth, our sixth session um, in the series that we are doing, our masterclass series. And you'll notice this, this week we had a little bit of a change. We're doing cultural life in the Vilna Ghetto, which is what we had scheduled. Unfortunately, um, Shani, who was supposed to be doing the lecture, is a little bit under the weather. So we wish her a full and speedy recovery. But we do have for you Dr. Yael Richler Friedman, who is the head of curriculum development of the teacher training department at Yad Vashem. And we're thrilled to have her here. She will be um, presenting to you today. And um, without further ado, I give you uh, Dr. Yael Rachel Friedman. We're thrilled to have her here today. Okay, shalom from Jerusalem, from, from Modi'in, everyone. Um, I'm honored to be in, the, in this series of lectures and to see in you all. I have to apologize for my Israeli English. Uh, my, my father is actually Canadian, but he never spoke English to us at home, only Hebrew. Uh, so the, the the battle of languages is a, is is a bit is a big one, and uh, you will see that uh, it is also a, an issue when we will talk about Vilna. So keep it in mind. In mind. Uh, so talking about the cultural life in the Vilna ghetto, uh, of course we need to first uh, um, remind ourselves uh, the the unique position of Vilna, because it's also uh, it had a, a affected its uh, unique uh, place in uh, history. So I'm sharing now my uh, part of my presentation. Um, yes, yeah, so we see here uh, Vilna, Vilnos, and this is again a, a part of the, of the question of all the, all the names of this place. How do we uh, uh, call it? Do we call it by the Polish name, by the uh, Russian name, how uh, uh, Germans called it? The thing is that uh, Vilna is situated here. It was a part of Poland during the times uh, uh, between the wars. And when the Nazis uh, occupied it, the, the, first, uh, the first stage of occupation of Poland, as we know, uh, somewhere we could say around here, uh, where according to the ribbentrop of uh, agreement, they entered the Western uh, part, uh, parts of uh, Poland and the West part, the, the East parts uh, were uh, actually uh, uh, taken by the Soviets who took Vilna and brought it back to Lita, Lithuania. And so in, for the first two years of the war, the Jews in, in, uh, in, uh, in Vilna were under the Lithuanian uh, uh, regime. And in 41, when the Nazis, when the Germans uh, entered the Western, uh, er the Eastern areas again, and occupied this area, uh, Vilna was one of the first being occupied. Why is it so important to understand? Because we know that in 41, if we think about the, the, the timeline of, of, the, of the war and of the mass killings, until 41, the Nazis didn't uh, uh, created uh, organized mass killings. There were a lot of people perished, uh, Jews perished because of the hunger, because of terror acts but not as a systematic uh, killing. In 41, it starts with the, the, what we know with the, with the pits and, and the, all, all these uh, systematic uh, killings. And the Jews of Vilna were one of the, of the first groups that uh, were the, the victims of, of that. But still, when we speak about the, uh, Vilna, and Jewish life in Vilna and, the, and uh, what happened to the, to the Jews in, in uh, Vilna during the war, it is important to understand Jewish life before the war. There was uh, just when the, the Nazis occupied uh, uh, when in, in sorry, 1939, 16,000 Jews lived in Vilna. They were uh, uh, almost a, a third of the population. And we need to understand that uh, um, the Jewish population in, in Vilna was uh, divided as, we're talking about Jews anyway, was divided into a few groups. First, we all know Vilna, the, the place of the uh, Gaon Vilna, a, a place of, uh, of, uh, of uh, learning the Torah and all the Tamidei Chachamim, all the rabbis. 
this was one part of Vilna Jews, a uh, rather small one at, the, at that time. So it's not Vilna of the 19th century or the 18th century where it was the, uh, a center of, of uh, religious lives. It was already, uh, it's, uh, the, 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 the plates or, or the amount of uh, uh, religious Jews in Vilna was less than a third of the uh, general Jewish population there. Uh, we do have a very strong, a very large group of what we call the Bund, what we call the, the Yiddish uh, uh, Jews, who were uh, mostly socialists, uh, non-religious, non-Zionist uh, group who encouraged a, a cultural Jewish life uh, through encouraging um, the, the Yiddish language as we can see here with the, with the newspapers that they, they published. Uh, the third group, a small one, the smallest, uh, was the Zionist group. Uh, if we're talking about uh, um, starting of, of all kinds of, of small organizations, smaller organizations of, of uh, uh, Zionist organizations, we can speak about them here. You will see soon why I'm putting some effort to, to, to explain this because this will, will, will come up again when we will speak about uh, Jewish life and, and, the, and the cultural life in the ghetto itself. We do see, uh, of course, that there's a very uh, uh, large Jewish community. There were all kinds of uh, uh, Jewish organizations and the, uh, the health, the, the, the self-help of uh, uh, the Jewish community itself. You see it down here. The, uh, the group uh, that uh, is encouraging uh, uh, tzedakah and giving and uh, social uh, kitchens, etc. Now, a few things we need to uh, to remember about uh, the Vilna ghetto. The Nazis occupied the area 24 uh, of uh, June 41. 16,000 Jews uh, were there and as you see, in less uh, in, in two two and a half months, we see a reduction. These are the numbers when we are talking about the mass killings uh, of the Vilna ghetto, the of, of the Vilna Jews. These are the first numbers. Now, instead of explaining what happened there in the pits in Ponar, ten kilometers away from the city, I want us to hear and to listen to one testimony of one youngster who was there with his uh, grandfather. So we will, uh, I will switch to the testimony now. Ani ayiti liad shavi. Lo ayanu lanu kvar koach, we bikashnu kvar hamavet sheyavu aleinu kama sheyoter maher. Lita yichad. קרה שמרטוט ויתן לנו לקשור העיניים. אני קשרתי העיניים קצת יותר גבוה שאני יכול לראות מה שיש מתחתיי ושהם לא ירגישו את זה. הליטאים שירו בנו, ירו ליטאים, לא גרמנים, והם ירו מרובים רגילים. הם עמדו מעל התעלה ואנחנו עמדנו בתוך התעלה כבר על ההרוגים ומאחורה נתנו פקודה לירות בזמן שנתנו הפקודה לירות סבי שמואל ליפשין אבא של אמי התחיל להגיד שמע ישראל אני הספקתי אני הספקתי רק פעם אחת להגיד שמע ישראל ותכף היה העירייה נפל, נפלתי לפני העירייה וההרוגים נפלו עליי
וככה שכבתי כל הזמן. לא בכיתי, הייתי כמובן. שכבתי, ירו וירו עוד. אחר כך, אחרי הרבה זמן, פחות ופחות התחילו לירות והיה נהיה ש, שקט, פחות או יותר. התחלתי, חשבתי שזה כבר לילה. התחלתי לי, להסתובב בגדי לצאת. כשהתחלתי להסתובב, תפסו אותי ברגל. התברר שמעלי שכב עוד אחת. גם היה לי אז, אני הייתי בן 16. היה עוד אחת ילד, גם בגילי בערך. הוא תפס אותי ברגל. התברר שגם הוא לא נפצע וגם הוא בסדר. אח... עזרנו אחת לשני. ‫ושבו יצאנו מתחת להרוגים. ‫אני בחרתי להתחיל בהתחלה ‫עם הזדמנות הזאת, ‫אם זה לא נכון, ‫זה לא נכון, ‫כי אנחנו נדבר על ‫הזדמנות להתחיל בחיים ‫בחיים בחיים בגטו, ‫ואנחנו חייבים לקחת בחשבון ‫שזה מה שקרה ‫בחיים בחיים בחיים בחיים, from where we, are going to, where we are going to speak about, and there is an effect on the lives of the Jews in the ghetto. Why is there an effect? The Jews who were taken, of course, no one told anyone who are they taken to, where, where are they taken to, what is going to happen to them. If someone said something, it was they're going to work, and that's it. But still the rumors got into the ghetto one by one. Some of the rumors are from these kind of people who were able to get out of the pit. Sometimes some of them came back to the ghetto. Sometimes others were trying to flee to somewhere else. And still, the, 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 the information that something horrible is happening in Ponar and who was sent to Ponar will not, be, uh, will not return anymore. They heard that. But still, It was unbelievable. It was such, a, such an unbelievable uh, uh, thing to think about that even if you knew it, you couldn't believe it. Even if you believe your city there, your elderly parents. What I can say? Now, we have to remember that there were people who were calling for action because of things. We see here, Abba Kovnes. Seems like we possibly have lost, right? Uh, yeah, Elle, maybe her, she's having some internet connectivity problems. Yes, I hope I ch I've changed the, the net. I hope it will be better now. So we, we were speaking about the, uh, the question of knowledge and the question of being able to do something about it during the, uh, the horrible times. And why am I putting this emphasis uh, uh, so strongly now? Because after the, uh, the first uh, actions and after the first killings, the remaining Jews were forced into the ghetto. 30, uh, 38,000 of them were forced into the ghetto. And by the next few uh, uh, months, more and more actions were taking place. And there were a constant uh, killing for the, for the Jews on one hand, and on the other, there is a constant question of what is really happening. And where are these people being taken for? We know about people who sent their uh, uh, Latvian, uh, 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 Lithuanian friends or help or aid to go and ask and to see what happened to their relatives who were taken from the ghetto. 
and they got the answers. They got answers. They are all being killed in Ponar and still unbelievable, impossible to, to, to act on that. For a year, almost a year, a, a bit more than a year, the action stopped. The ghetto was able to show the Nazis that they are working enough and they are profitable enough for them. And for all kinds of Nazi uh, um, reasons, there were no actions. This time we called it the stabilization. From uh, the beginning of, 40, uh, of 42 till uh, March uh, of uh, 43. At that time, we see all kinds of phenomena that would tell us that, that tells us that people wanted to still have cultural, spiritual life. And how do we know about them? Because when the war ended, 44, and Abba Kovner, after he wasn't able to create a, a revolt in the ghetto, he flee to the uh, forest, he was a partisan, he comes back as a partisan to Vilna, and he found together with his friends 200 posters published in the ghetto. And I want us to look at a few of them. But before we do that, I would ask Laurie to read to you um, a part of a testimony of uh, Mark Dvorjetsky. So I'm sharing and I hope the, uh, the internet will, will be able to, to cope with that. Please, Lori. Mark Dvorjetsky was, he was a, a, a physician in the ghetto and he's telling us, what does it mean to live in, in these kind of conditions on one hand in the ghetto, on the other, there is the, the, always the question of not only how do I get tomorrow's uh, loaf of bread, but also what happened to the people who were taken? And when will they come back and take us again? Please, Laurie. Okay. Can everybody hear me? Yeah? Okay. Who can fathom the state of mind and the mood of the ghetto man? How does he adjust to ghetto conditions? How does he respond to them? You need to fight for your life. You must always remain alert as at any moment an unexpected danger can ambush you. You must control your mood, your nerves, foresee dangers and avoid them, escape them. Hope until the last moment, over, overcome and live under all conditions in spite of the conditions. The ghetto is a temporary circumstance after which will come freedom. These are the fundamental thoughts of everyone in the ghetto. Hold on, this is the aspiration, the motto of every person. In the most difficult times of the action, you must display self-control. And if you do not, you will be lost and are bound to lose the precious opportunity to save your own life. You must dress reasonably so as not to forget that you are human. You can't be slovenly. If your soul is weighted down with concern, go to a concert, a play at the ghetto theater. You need to put aside the sadness so that you'll be able to think and sadness will not cloud your thoughts at a critical time. Like someone receiving medication, like those who receive a transfusion, this is how it was for those who periodically went to the satire plays at the theater, to laugh a little and dissipate the black bitterness, to force themselves into a lighter mood and forget for several hours the melancholy and despair. So I, I would like to claim that there is a, a contradiction in, in, in what he's telling us here. Uh, what, what kind of a contradiction? When he starts, he speaks about being alert, right? You have to remain alert <laughs> any moment. You have to, 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 to see the danger that is coming to you. What kind of a state of mind is that? State of mind of what? Of being so, so alert? You have to be like, I would say generally, Men, maybe even like a hunted animal, right? They are coming to get you, they are coming to kill you. You have to be able to, to see where they're coming from in every second, every moment. 
On the other side, he says, you must dress reasonably. You have to go to a concert. How can you be alert <laughs> or accept, expecting danger when you're going to a concert? There is a contradiction here. And I would like to hear what do you think about it? Or do you see it also? Is it a contradiction in, in, in your mind? Or do you see it just uh, uh, fit uh, quite right? What do you think about it? You're welcome, as Laurie told you, just to, to press space and, and tell us. Was it a coping mechanism? Wh which one of them? Of the, the two sides? The, the second one, the living, living like a mensch, going to the theater. So you, you need a coping me mechanism on one hand. The coping, you have to still remember, as you said, you're a mensch. You're a person. You have to fight for your life. But the thing is that sometimes, if, as you fight for your life, and we saw it in other, in, 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 we see it in, in all kinds of testimonies. People are saying, uh, they, they created the monster out of me. <laughs> they made me think uh, like an animal, only thinking about food. So what will I fight for? What life? So you need to have on one hand life and on the other, be able to still be alive. And you have to, to, to work with those two uh, uh, emotions at once. Even though that naturally, psychologically, people are dividing those into two. Um, Laurie, something from the chat that... Uh... Yeah, somebody wrote here that you can't be total fight or flight to cope and need some light to mitigate the darkness, to make it make less darkness. So that's what Charlotte said. Yeah, and keeping your humanity. So again, keeping your humanity, so you will have the strength to live. Because in, we know that many times the, the uh, uh, scholars and, and also from the testimony, we see that people are talking about despair. And when you, you are alert all the time, it gets, it gets you. And, and, and when you're in the state of mind of, of fleeing and fleeing, you are getting into despair and therefore you are not even trying anywhere anymore to go on fleeing, just saying, okay, just leave me alone. And we know that from many, many uh, stories of, of survivors telling us that they saw another person giving up their lives, not killing themselves, not committing uh, suicide, but stopped fighting. And many of them say, I saw that he stopped fighting when he didn't change what he <laughs> was wearing, when, he stopped going out when he stopped talking to me. So in order to, 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 to avoid this, this uh, uh, process, on one hand, again, you need to be alert, but you have to find ways uh, for cultural uh, light. And as I said, I want us to look at a few of these uh, uh, posters published in the ghetto. And we'll try to understand a bit what does it mean to have cultural life uh, in the shadow of death, practically on in, in the shadow of death. So I'm starting with this one. Um, we already uh, uh, jumped into the the, the English. Um, I'm trying to see if, if we can see first the Hebrew. No, it gets us <laughs> straight to, to the English. So. Look at that and tell me what can you ask about these posters. Of course, uh, written as you saw, written in, uh, in uh, uh, Yiddish, mostly, uh, as we spoke about uh, the Yiddish speaking uh, uh, population in, uh, in Vilna is, is the largest one. So what do we see here? What can we ask ourselves when looking at that? Here again, sorry, found a way to, to see the Hebrew. 
or sorry, the Hebrew uh, letters, the Yiddish. Such a variety, Yael. What do you see, the variety of what? What do you see here? Oh, classical, light music, a play. Um, Some Hebrew also. Uh, now, um, one, of, one of the mo most moving uh, things for me in that, in that sense is the memorial service for this person who was killed, one, one of the, of the uh, uh, intellectual group. They are actually dedicating a day for memorial. And if, if we thought about this mechanism of, 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 of coping, you, you think about, okay, I have to, to you know, escapism. I need, I need to, to escape from the mood of, of the ghetto. And still in the theater, one day is dedicated to one of the murdered person. Now it's for one of the murdered person, not the thousands, because it's sometimes hard to commemorate the thousands. You do, but 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 you suddenly think about one person, Gerstein, who was a teacher. He was killed. No, now I have to think about him, and not let myself forget about humanity and forget my friendship with this person. Um, we need to, to remember that the, uh, the concerts were not uh, uh, undebatable. The fact that there was that there were concerts, the fact the fact that there were that there was a theater in the ghetto operating and alive uh, was not convenient, and, and people were against it. Uh, you, we can see some of the of the. Some, uh, uh, some thoughts about having a theater in the ghetto. So um, please, uh, uh, Laurie, can you, run, can you read from Gantz uh, words? Gantz is, the, of course, the head of the, in the, head, the, head of the Judenrat. These uh, activities were organized by the Judenrat and he, um, he's concluding a year of, uh, of the theater of the, oh, the reopening of the theater in Vilna. So if you can read first the, the first uh, uh, sentence. From Jacob Genz? Yes. Before the first concert, it was said that concerts should not be conducted in the cemetery. So who said that? We know there were a lot of people who said that. One of them was Krug, who was the head of the library in the ghetto. So it's not a person that uh, thinks that uh, cultural life is not, is not important. But when he's saying concert should not be conducted in a cemetery, what is he actually telling us? Why is he involved in the uh, cemetery in, inside? Why is he speaking about what should and shouldn't be in the, in the ghetto? What is he telling us? What is it? What, what, what's, what, what's the problem with the concert? I don't want to be reminded of death. So, and the concert will, what, what will be the role of the concert? Why is he speaking about the cemetery? You know, in, 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 in Jewish culture, in Jewish law, there is a separation. And when you have death around you, and when you have the Shiva, and then you have the Shloshim, and then you have the Yorotite, there are things that you are, are, you are supposed to do, and there are things that you are not supposed to do. And you're supposed to divide life and death, right? Death is the first, the, about the Tuma. death is something that when it enters life, you need to have ways to separate life and death. And if we're talking about moral standards, in a cemetery, if you want to have moral standards, you want to have the good and the bad, the death and life, if you want to have one strict line between those, you have to separate. So in a cemetery, which is dedicated to the dead, you're not supposed to have 
music. You're not supposed to have cultural life. Then Jewish <laughs> tradition will take you out of the connection to death slowly, slowly, and, and, and will allow you eventually to have it. But you are not allowed to have it there because it is not moral. So he's going back to moral life as he knew them before the war. And he was, of course, a uh, um, crook. Uh, he, he's from the, the Bund uh, uh, group, uh, a Yiddish uh, uh, intellectual. And he's saying, this is, th this is not our moral way of thinking. What is Gantz answering him? Please, Lori. Okay. Um... He says, this is true, but now life itself is a cemetery. It is okay. Now life itself is a cemetery. So if, Kruk, if Kruk's rationale is saying, okay, I have my moral way of thinking and what you're doing here is wrong. It's not like we thought for many, many years. Gantz is telling him, the rules has changed. Life itself is a cemetery. How can you live in a cemetery? You need a new code of life in order to be able to live in a cemetery. And here comes the question, what is the point where you are changing your moral code? Crook is saying you're not supposed to change it. Gantz is saying, if I want to live, in a cemetery, I must change it. So the debate here is about, can we still live by the codes that we lived by for, for so many years? Or is the chaos is total and we need to change it all now? And this is the, the major question that uh, uh, <laughs> was accompanying the whole uh, uh, cultural life that we see here, conducting the cultural life in, in, in the ghetto, this, this was the main, the main question that uh, arose again and again. Now, let's see this. Some Yiddish, someone understand any word here or? I, 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 I don't understand Yiddish either, so uh, feel free. But still there are some words that I would try to, to read. Something you, 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 you can see here, it's something you can uh, understand here. Someone? Tickets the for says, a lottery. Tickets for a lottery, Yael. Tickets for a lottery. You see it here, Lamed Aleph is lo lottery. Bill attend, bill attend uh, 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 a ticket. Uh, there are 5,000 of them, and this is a, the, their cost. Uh, how much they cost? A lottery in. How would Crook call it? The cemetery. Why? Why would a person go and buy a lottery ticket in the cemetery? Let's look a bit on, on the English. You remember we saw the picture of the uh, self-aid, self-help in, in, in Vilna before the war? It is still active in the ghetto and they need to raise some money. How do you do that? Now, lottery is, of course, what, what, what does it go with? What, what's your first, first uh, uh, um, association with lottery? Lottery is for? Hope. Hope, because it's for the future. Tomorrow will be better, but you know, that yesterday, most of your family was killed. So what tomorrow? And the, the Nazis are still there. What tomorrow? So it's about tomorrow. It's about dreams. You start fantasizing what would you buy, but in the ghetto, you cannot buy anything. <laughs> or at, at least most of the things that you would like to buy to yourself in the, in, in the life before, you, before the Holocaust are now irrational. So, if we know it was made for, uh, for the self-help, uh, uh, why not give 
some money to the self had without the, the lottery why do they have to go with this campaign why can't you they just go and ask okay we need some money why lottery because so you are your spirits what you sorry to look for to look for something to, to to give them a boost to give them some help but so you are buying hope but how many can which, afford it in a ghetto no money coming in so if if i am still uh having something worth to sell and get some money from and then buy some hope what can you buy in the ghetto you, you're buying hope. You're buying your own human dignity. I was a player. I like to play. I like to, to, to go by the edge. I'm still myself. And if I can help some people with that, well, great. We know that sometimes we <laughs> are having more. It's easier for us to give money for, for something that I might get something out of it, even though I know that the chances are, are very, very low, because I'm a human being. And I, I do want to help and I do want to feel some hope. And this is the way to buy it. Uh, one of the testimonies that uh, 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 is also talking about the, the self-aid, uh, I would like you to read, Laurie, from the diary of uh, Moshe Ol Olietsky. Okay. Worth noting, the students from the school at Chvalili Street one raised from among themselves 209 rubles for their fellow students who came to school hungry they asked their teachers to take the money and arrange breakfast for their hungry friends so you can give like that specifically if you're a youngster seeing now think about all, all the all the acts that needs to be done here you have to see your friends you have to understand that they are hungry. You have to understand that they are more hungry than you are. You have to understand that you might have something that can help them. And now you have to organize your friends for that. Every act here is, we cannot take for granted. We need to think about all the small steps because we remember what Vrojevsky told us about these human beings. They are now hunted. And they are able to stop for a second and just think, okay, I have something to eat. My friends do not. One of the testimonies that I heard connected to that is that one of the children just got to the, to, to, to the school and she fainted because of hunger. And then, the next morning, she found a sandwich by her table after thinking she cannot come to school anymore because she will not be able to learn. She tried to come one day and then she found the sandwich. And this was kept her going and going to school. So these kids had, <laughs> uh, uh, absolutely learned something uh, more unique than you can from these schools. Now we have to be honest with ourselves. Most will not give something just out of something, just for nothing. We said, this is why we see the lottery. I want to, to have something else, something extra. And this is a part of the question of what do we see here in the posters? Because the posters show us life very vivid life, very vivid community. And we need to remember that this is the nature of posters in general. You are calling people to come and do and read and, but it's most of the people were fighting for their lives every day, fighting for the next loaf of bread every day, fainting from hunger. And still the fact that this existed is a way of telling us something about their lives. In this sense, I want us to look here. Any word that you can read, understand? Basketball. 
mention. Yes, yesterday was the draft of the NBA, right? Basketball mention. Even I got to know it because it is such a huge part of life, the sport, specifically for certain people. Wow, we are alive, we have sports. Basketball mention, uh, now I'll, I'll get to the, to the English. What do we see here? What strikes you? They try to make life as normal as possible. It's normal and it's more than normal. I see a women's league, basketball women's league, because we are talking about modern city in a modern country in the 20th century. So we see that the seniors and we see the women and we see the boys all trying to be a part of these activities. Um, Da, da, da. Sorry. I'm looking for one here. Now, how do, for, in order to have a, a basketball mention, <laughs> a basketball uh, 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 league, you need some space. So the Judenrat, after some liquidations from the ghetto, and when I'm saying liquidations, I'm talking about murders. People were taken to be killed and their houses were standing there un, un, unpopular with no people inside. So they ruled these places and created a field and opened it festivically. Now let's, uh, Laurie, if you can read from Rushka Korchak's mem memoirs about this opening, grand opening of the, of the of the field. Okay. The ghetto even had a sports field. Workers went to great efforts to create it, clearing, lining, expanding the field by destroying adjoining buildings that were unfit for use. And it indeed, indeed, it was announced that the next day there would be a festive opening ceremony for the sports field, entrance by invitation only. At the ceremony, representatives of the Judenrat and the police were present, including Saf Dessler, a Jewish policeman, and Yosef Moshka, deputy head of the Judenrat. Moshka said, if in years to come, one will wish to trace and understand our life in the ghetto and no documentation remains, this field will faithfully testify to the essential vitality and the unbridled spirit of life that dwells within us. And Stop for a second. What will be the testimony of their, what does he call it, uh, uh, vi 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 vitality? Mm -hmm. What is the testimony for their vi vitality? The empty field. So you see these people are looking for ways for people to remember they lived here. We asked ourselves in the beginning, do they know, do they not know? Did they acknowledge it or not? So it's a matter of speaking. Yes, I want people to know that I lived here, but it's not only a matter of speaking. This is life. I'm living and I don't know what will happen tomorrow and whether I will still be alive tomorrow. And still I'm planning a field. And I'm telling the people who are going to be killed in a few month in 10 kilometers from there in Punar. I'm telling them, ha, ah, they will know that we lived. How will they know? They will see the empty field. The emptiness will be the proof of our life. This is the, 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 the how would you call that? This field, what, what, what kind of a headline can we give to this field? What, what is this field? A memorial. memorial. A living memorial, because they are still practicing there. They are, they are still having their, con their sport uh, uh, league there. 
did the uh, basketball survive a uh, basketball field yes that uh, the, the field survived yes i'm i'm very sorry i thought that i had the pictures here uh, maybe in, in in the end I, I will show you one one of the pictures yes we have some pictures wow i'm sorry i i, I will have to uh laurie mm -hmm. try google field okay. football Vilna Ghetto, because there are some, uh, um, there is graffiti also that's safe there. So when you when you find it, uh, uh, let us know. Okay. Okay. Uh, and now I'm coming from the uh, international school, so education, uh, of course, is always uh, uh, one of the most important things for me. Um, so even if you don't read. The Hebrew letters or the Yiddish. Uh, what do we see here? I told you already, and you see it. This is about the lectures. We see um, the 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 hours and and the uh, and and the dates of those lectures, and we see the uh, the content: physics, chemi chemistry, and literature. On Saturday. Sunday uh, and uh, uh, Wednesday. What can we say about the times? We all now have questions about when to learn and how to learn. And <laughs> what do you say about the times in this uh, poster? All at night. At night, why? To Both? hide, to do it without others knowing, maybe. What is happening during the day? People are working. People are working. People are working. Working. Teachers are working. So this is not the uh, regular uh, um, school system for the young children that they were uh, uh, allowed to have in uh, the ghetto. This is the, uh, uh, the extracurricular uh, studies for the children who are supposed to work, for the elders. Yes, you see also the, the, the topics. It's not a uh, reading and it's not a uh, first uh, some, some Bible. No, this is for more education. People do not want the children to, to stay without any knowledge, without any uh, uh, ability to, to, again, we spoke about hope. Education is about hope. I want you to know some more. Why do you need to, to know some more? Because I hope you will be able to use it. I, I want to open your mind to new things and you are all welcome to come and learn after the harsh work, after um, these uh, difficult days. Um, so a little bit about uh, the learning. Um, uh, Laurie, can you read for us from uh, Rodoshevsky's diary? For me, the drive to learn was a rebellion against the present in which learning was hated and working prized. I was determined to live in the future and not the present. If of 100 children in the ghetto my age, 10 could learn, I had to be among them to take advantage of this opportunity. So I think he's, unfortunately, uh, he didn't survive, uh, but uh, he's telling it in, in, in the best way in his, in, in, in his words. This is against what I'm living now. I'm thinking about hope. I'm thinking about what it means to be a human being, not as I'm learning in the ghetto how it means to be, but as I believe I need to be. Um, I want us to, to, to read one uh, uh, more uh, um, um, testimony about the, the education in the ghetto that will take us back to what we have just spoken about in the beginning, about the languages and the different groups in uh, the Vilna ghetto. So please, Laurie, I know we have five more minutes, so this will be the almost the, the the last thing that we will see yes and i have that picture for you so don't forget if you want um, okay <laughs> I, think, I believe in the period following the ghetto's establishment a cultural struggle broke out regarding the character and essence of the schools their educational aims 
the choice of teachers and the curriculum. It was a struggle for the soul of the ghetto child. What would be the national and collective goals toward which children would be educated that would compri comprise their spiritual legacy? Were they to be freed? Questions arose as to the extent the ghetto schools should emphasize Hebrew, Yiddish, Eretz Israel, Tanakh Bible studies, Jewish and world history. Which periods, which heroes demanded the special attention of the educators? Now, again, remember all the different groups, each <laughs> pulling to its, to its side, right? Who, who are the heroes that we're going to speak about? How do we define the Maccabim? Are there the, the, the freedom fighters? Are they fighting for religion? Who are they and how do we teach about them? And in what language, please? Um, it was determined that the language of instruction for all schools and all classes would be Yiddish. However, Hebrew language and literature would be taught as well, emphasizing the language's great value to the Jewish nation and culture in all its generations. Jewish history, Jewish history would be a central subject in school studied in parallel with world history. Tanakh would also be a fundamental subject in the school system. Now, I want to tell you, I'm... As you can understand, I'm, I'm a Zionist and I'm religious. And when I say this about the Vilna uh, community, it makes me very, very sad. Why? Because as I said before, the strongest party is the Bund, the Yiddish speaking, you know, the secular, the secular Yiddish. The fact that Hebrew had become a large part of life in the Vilna ghetto is a loss of the Bund perspective. The Bund saying, we will go on living in wherever we were born and we will fight for our rights here. This was <laughs> a fundamental uh, uh, thought. But now in the ghetto, Okay, we can speak about Eretz Israel, we can speak about Hebrew. This is hope, but hopeless hope. It is not rational to, to learn Hebrew in the ghetto. Why are we learning Hebrew for? You will not be able, it's, it, it's such a, a long distance dream to go on living in Israel after that. Who is going to live tomorrow? So it's like taking a fantasy as, as a dream, as something for your hopes and not something that is rational because you gave up the ideas you had before. Not, most of them kept on with their ideas, but I'm saying that the fact that they even considered putting some more Hebrew in their schools is evident for stop believing in the hopes they had before the war. A lot of them. This is a fantasy. This is escapism. <laughs> I'm a I, I am a Zionist. For me, Israel is, is reality. For them, it's escaping to a place that will not be fulfilled. And this is what is so sad about it. Now, uh, Laurie will show you soon the uh, the picture, but I want us to to conclude our discussion with one uh, piece of, of music written in the ghetto. We'll bring Yiddish back to the center and let's hear a, a song they wrote in, Leib Rosenthal wrote in the ghetto and we know that in the concert, we know that in their uh, 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 in, in some of the meetings, they were singing that and also in the cabaret. So I'll just see if the shared music is on here. Mir 
in jeder Show. Wir werden leben und erleben, schlechte Zeiten nach überleben. Wir leben ewig, wir sind ein Dorf, wir leben ewig. Es brennt der Welt, wir leben ewig, wir leben aus dem Geld. Und es zerpicken ist die alles an ihm, was wir in uns verschwarzen. So, with their words and with this picture of the action taking them to death, um, I will leave us with the question that I suppose that uh, <laughs> arose uh, during thinking about the, those days and, the, and, the, and these efforts for cultural lives. Uh, most of them will will be will never be able to answer. Uh, Laurie, if you can share the the the, the football field. You have it? Okay. Uh, so yeah, the uh, inscriptions talking about uh, health and sports and how healthy it is for you to exercise and how strong it will make you. Uh, this was left. Thank you, Laurie. Lori, I can't hear you. Do you hear, Lori? There we go. Now, can you hear me now? Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, all right. So, Yael, thank you so much. Oh, wait, am I sharing? Hold on. Let me just stop my share here. Um, am I still sharing my screen? Stops. There we go. Okay. All right. So, Yael, thank you so much. Um, and we have time for, if anybody has one or two questions that they want to write in, I'm happy to, um, we can present those questions to Elle right now. One person did ask when you were just talking about the schools, uh, they said, wouldn't each of the different groups have had their own school? So, she um, so um, no, because A, A the, the, the Nazis agreed only for one uh, primary school, as we know that this was one of, a, a part of their method. So people will learn how to read the local language to read the the <laughs> the, uh, the posters of the Nazis, etc. So they they agreed only for for very very thin uh, group uh, to learn uh, in in primary school, uh, but the ultra religious uh, parents organized the school for their uh, students for the children, and it was an underground school, and they were not supposed to learn there. One of the things that uh, uh, I didn't say that how. How can how does Mark Dvorjetsky and uh, um, goes to the school and uh, and is involved in the school? Uh, the reason is because they are um, uh, they were giving some extra milk in the school and this is why children would come. A lot of them were afraid to come because they were afraid that when there will be an action, of course, the children will be separated from their parents and they will be sent. So the way of the Udenrat to 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 get them into the schools was through the, the milk and the extra food. And in the underground schools, for example, for the, for the Haredic schools, this was not uh, applying. So, so, so this is it. No, they were only uh, able to have one school. Okay, uh, looks like we have one more question here. Did the ghetto continue until the end of the war? Else. No, I'm sorry, of course, uh, not uh, um, in the first uh, uh, presentation, the, uh, um, the PowerPoint presentation that I showed, there was the, the, the day 20th uh, 6th of uh, uh, September, 43, the last action and uh, the last Jews were uh, sent from there. Um, some of them were able to flee to the uh, forest uh, to join the partisans, as I spoke about uh, Abba Kovner and his group, uh, but most of them were 
were killed. Uh, and as I said, gradually during the time, but eventually uh, in, in the end of September were, were the last killings. Okay, um, I think we have time for one more question. So um, it says somebody, Ezra, wrote in, it seems that the Warsaw Ghetto had all their cultural activities at, at the start before the great deportations, then after they thought about uprising. Whereas in Vilna, despite the mass killing starting at the beginning, they still decided to proceed with cultural, cultural activities yes. and not an uprising. Is that correct? Uh, I thought that there is a, um, a contradiction, but, but, but a built one, because a person wants to believe that he's going to live. And in order, as, as we saw, in order to be, be able to live, I need some cultural life. So in the Warsaw Ghetto, they, the first few months, nobody thought about mass killings because it, 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 the, the Nazis even didn't think about it then and didn't plan it then. So you're, you, you go to the ghetto and you're trying to plan your life and you're trying to organize them through how you believe life worth living and then you create uh, uh, um, the cultural life. In Vilna and in generally in the Eastern uh, uh, areas, after the first mass killings, and as I said, th this was flourishing in the times, in, in, in one year that there were hardly any actions. So people would rationalize and say, okay, so they took who they wanted. Now we are going to live. So we'll have to create life as we believe in, and then we'll create cultural life. So it's, it's, it's a contradiction that uh, it's, it's the same state of mind that uh, uh, arose from different uh, uh, historical uh, circumstances. Okay, um, and it looks like our time is up now. So I just wanna thank everybody once again for joining us, I suppose, it's evening by you in Australia. <laughs> Here it's the middle of the day. Um, so we, once again, thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you next week. Yeah, El, again, thank you so much for um, helping us out today mm -hmm. and for that wonderful and meaningful and insightful presentation and the discussion. That was a little different for us here. And I appreciate everybody who joined in. Um, and we look forward to seeing you all next week. Once again, just Check your email on Tuesday, sign up, and we'll see you on Thursday. All right. So everyone, thank you from Yad Vashem. Bye-bye. Goodbye.